day, prison reentry, helping former inmates transition to life after serving behind bars. From access to health care to gaining the skills to enter the workforce, programs here in New Jersey are proving to be economically successful and inspirational. The person leading that charge, former Governor Jim McGreevy, who made it his mission to help those who need it and to break the cycle of incarceration. Today, we sit down with the governor and with Erica Jednak, a leading advocate for re-entry employment. Why this is an issue that reaches across the aisle and unites politicians of both parties. It's all ahead on New Jersey Now. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Doctor and welcome to New Jersey Now. Today we're talking about an important issue and something that has been surfacing more and more in our consciousness. The idea of prisoners re-entering society. What kind of support should we give them? Should they be left to their own devices? Should we be intervening? And with me today, two people who really know this subject inside out. I'm going to start with Governor McGreevy. You've been involved in this for many years. It's become your passion. It's become a livelihood for you. Explain what you do and um, how it makes an impact here well, in New Jersey. One, thank you very much for bringing us together and, and having a focus of a show that brings great attention to this issue. One of the things uh, in America, we're 5% of the world's population, but we're 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And I don't think Americans are necessarily more malevolent or, or evil. It's that we've used our criminal justice system, particularly for those that are addicted or those historically have had certain challenges. And so I think there's an understanding that as opposed to just incarcerating individuals, that we have to help them on the road back. Um, if you call it a second chance. And this is one of the few issues that both Republicans, whether it's the Coke Industries, uh, whether Jared Kushner, um, whether Chuck Schumer on the right and left, we understand that we can do reentry better. So what we provide people is the critical importance of employment, training and employment. As my father used to say, the best social welfare program in the world is a job. Employment is so critically important. Health care, uh, whether somebody has hepatitis, HIV, diabetes, uh, the importance of good medical care, addiction. Uh, so many of our clients, the, the conflation between addiction and criminal behavior. And then also working with them to provide, uh, to address the legal wreckage of their lives, uh, to make sure that they have an identification, a driver's license. Uh, many of our clients walk out of the Department of Corrections with just a DOC ID. Well, they can't access general assistance. They can't access an apartment. They can't file an employment application. So it's reintroducing them into modern society, giving them all the existing tools that exist now, but helping them on a critical pathway to responsible citizenship. Erica, none of this is relevant if they can't get a job, correct? That's correct, and the dignity of work is so important. Governor McGreevy has been a, a leader in this space for many years, and along with the Coke Network, Americans for Prosperity. You know, there's legislation that has been moving that would lift the ban on licensing. So professional licensing is a, a big issue. There's over 200 licensing bureaucracies right now in the state of New Jersey. And folks, even with a minor marijuana conviction from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, are banned from being a hair braider, a cosmetologist, even skills that they learn behind prison walls. This is important to reduce recidivism when folks get out uh, so that they contribute meaningfully to society. There are a lot of barriers in place and there's opportunities now to reduce those barriers to opportunity. It's good for reducing recidivism as well as saving taxpayer dollars because right now the state of New Jersey uh, it costs over $60,000 a year just to incarcerate someone. What Erica said is so critically important is that you know, we had a perspective, get tough on crime. So you can't be a cosmetologist, you, you can't be a healthcare aide. And so basically what we did is we precluded people from earning a living. And so at the end of the day, if, if you don't have a career opportunity, you don't have an employment opportunity with necessary training and compensation, well then we condemn people to running and gunning and doping. And so I think what we understand is if 97% of the individuals in, in county jails or state prisons are coming home, then we need to begin to think about 
How are they going to be productive, law-abiding, healthy citizens? How are they going to provide for their families, for themselves? And that's why I just applaud the work that Eric has done, because it's, it's understanding people need ultimately at the end of the day to be self-sustaining through employment. Governor McGreevy, your organization was kind enough to give us some video clips of people that have emerged from prison and have re-entered society. There's some success stories. Let's take a look. to get my freedom because my release date is 2035. And President Obama sent me free. One thing that he told me in the letter that he sent me for his hand ride, he said that he believed in me, that he's gonna give me a second chance. Some great examples there. Um, what are the numbers on this? How many people are you helping and how much more could you do? Well, right now we have 6,000 clients and so, one of the areas of concern is that we not only have to provide for housing, we have to make sure that they have access to health care, but employment and training. So when you have 6,000 clients, it's, it's providing case management. But we also need to understand in the state of New Jersey, we have one of the highest max out rates, those people who serve the full measure of their sentence. So in, in the nation, it's approximately 21% of the people serve the entirety of the sentence. In New Jersey, it's about 42%. And so that we need to think about doing this a little better, and that's why reentry is so important. Because when somebody comes out of prison and they've served the entirety of their sentence, whether it's seven years or 17 years or 27 years, they candidly don't have any computer skills. In many cases, their family has moved on. They don't have any housing opportunities, and they don't have any linkage to the community, and that's what reentry does. But I would also argue that parole is so important. Any time the individual being released from prison has support, whether it's from parole or Department of Corrections, usually the better. For our clients who are max outs, reentry is the only game in town. If they don't have reentry, candidly, they're sleeping in the bus station, they're sleeping in the train station, they have no access to food. And so what happens for many of our clients not, is, is they get nervous, they're fearful. You know, for the past 10 years, somebody has given me food three times a day, somebody has given me a cot, somebody has told me what to do, and now I'm out of this facility. Now how do you get past employers who are asking them to take in somebody who's been in prison, for whatever reason, but been in prison, and that's stigma. How do you get to employers and, and convince them that this is a good idea? I think there's a changing paradigm in America, moving from tough on crime to smart on crime. Just a couple weeks ago, Coke Industries, along with Shrem, and companies across America actually put forth a commitment to hire individuals with criminal records. So I think some of this is cultural and as society we're changing, you know, especially with mass incarceration being a hot topic politically and in the public policy sphere that things need to change drastically and employment, the dignity of work is so important for individuals to become more self-sufficient. You know, I, I've gone to every Italian and Jewish owned business in New Jersey and families get it. Like New Jersey families get it. I mean whether they're making rye bread or family businesses will give you a break. I mean candidly some of the problems are a large major corporation whose corporate offices are in Chicago or Iowa who has no connection to the community. So family owned businesses and I can like rattle off a list of names um, who, whether their families have been touched by addiction or they know somebody, will give somebody a second chance out of a sense of human empathy. And bluntly, they're New Jersey families. But when I'm dealing with a corporate office, it says corporate policy, no drug conviction, no X, Y, or Z. And in those cases, it's really tough. I've had cases where people have been honest on their employment application, but it was discovered literally in, in some cases 18, 19 months into their employment, and then the local regional manager has attempted to apply to HR and said, but this is a good employee, and they've had a blanket position against employment. 
And so it is difficult, and, and to go to what Erica said, is, is that a local business, a family-owned business particularly, they've been tremendous because they understand that people make mistakes and, and they give opportunities, provided the crime isn't directly related to the course of business. But we do have, as, as companies are larger, and particularly if they're out of state, and we can't navigate to that HR vice president, then it's difficult. Great discussion. We'll be right back. Coming up, we'll hear more about what employers can do to help prisoners return to society. Stay tuned. We're back, and in the movies and on television, we see inmates being released from prison in that fictionalized world where they literally, they're handed their goods back, they put their clothes on, they walk out, and if they're lucky enough to get a ride somewhere, they get a ride somewhere, but we know that it really doesn't happen that way, that the movies and TV are different from real life. Can you, Governor, walk us through what happens when somebody leaves prison, has been there an extended period of time? What process is there for them to go through? Great question. It depends where they're at and what they've done. So for our clients, uh, we deal with people coming out of the federal system, uh, people that are on parole in the state system where they have the ability to have parole, people that are maxed out where literally they, they don't have the ability, they're, they're on parole and they come close to that television scenario. Uh, we also work with, with individuals that, um, for example, are in drug court. So it depends on what the criminal justice system can be fairly complex. And what we understand is, in terms of reducing the ability, or reducing the probability that somebody's going to commit another crime, is, is the more contacts with the state, the more contacts with nonprofit agencies, the more contacts with hospitals, with drug treatment, the better. And so what we do in the New Jersey reentry, it's almost a, a triage, hospital triage, so that you have Medicaid, uh, you have uh, the importance of having access to prescription drugs, to treatment. You have sober structured housing. You have employment and training. You know, one of the important things is to have an industry recognized credential. Is there a point person from your group that tracks these individuals? Yes. Yes, and, and that's what's so important to what we do. I mean, we have something called Salesforce, which most uh, Fortune 100 corporations have, and so we track every single one of our clients. We track their employment, we uh, track their recidivism, uh, where they live, uh, contacts. And so at the end of the day, we're able to say, well, you know, what was the probability of employment? What training paid off? Uh, what training yielded the greatest economic returns. So that if we have all of these individuals coming out of state prisons, part of this is we can't offer everybody a customized bl educational blueprint and say, you know, whether it's a magnet school, whether it's a public school, a university. So we have to discern what works. And so that's why we do something called the tape test, the adult basic education test, to determine their reading proficiency, their mathematics so proficiency. So you literally sit them down and give them exactly. a test. Exactly. Give them a test. We need to know where you're starting from. And so then we can decide, all right, are you going to go into the building trades? Are you going to develop a certification for HVAC system or a commercial driver's license? And so we try to work with those industries to go to your earlier point that are receptive to hiring uh, the formerly incarcerated. What are the most successful stories that you have in terms of putting people into work? What particular industries seem the well, most receptive? I'll share the example of the New Jersey Restaurant Association. So they're actually working on programming behind prison walls to train so that individuals can have skills that they can leverage when they're outside. And in this, right, they can be so talented, come out with a skill set, get a job, and yet there are archaic laws still unfortunately in place that I think through time, things will change, but specifically around liquor licenses. So if a restaurant has a liquor license, a lot of times someone cannot work in a kitchen or bar area if they have a record, because there's actually a ban for restaurants with liquor licenses. Would your From, legislation correct that or no? There's separate legislation that would be moving. Uh, also cosmetology. So there's a lot of women who learn hair braiding and uh, even culturally, right, in the African-American community. And so if they're able to then go out and have a hair braiding business, that's excellent, right? They can provide for themselves, their family, contribute meaningfully to society. Likewise, with some of the building trades and carpentry, right, if they learn these skills, they can leverage that when they're and, outside. And that's to go to every point, is helping the 
formerly incarcerated to recognize that the skills that I've acquired behind the wall can be transferable. With, say for example, Candido Ortiz, or our client, 28 years in federal prison, uh, he would have served a almost 50-year sentence. He was pardoned during the Obama administration. He came out. He had all these skills. He worked in restaurants all throughout the federal prison system. We were able to secure for him a bank loan, and now he has a restaurant on Martin Luther King Drive in Jersey City, a small restaurant, a bodega, but it's flourishing. And so part of it is converting these skills to the public marketplace. And again, politicians, myself included, whether they were right or left, said, we're going to get tough on crime. But what it strangely and ironically did was to make it more difficult for these persons to resume a healthy, productive employment. And so when we look at the fact that 1% of the population is having a disproportionate negative impact on the criminal justice system, on personal property, part of this is we want these people to be employed. We want these people to be engaged in healthy, productive citizenship. And I think that's what Erica does so importantly in terms of removing these bureaucratic obstacles and God willing what we do in terms of helping people manage themselves, their addiction, their employment, their housing, their health care, so they get back into society. I'll, I'll leave you with one thought. I was at, uh, in New York and I was volunteering for a group called Exodus and I just started in this field, and I was trying to get an identification, a New York license, and it was the most challenging, frustrating, exasperating experience like of my life. And then ironically, you know, after serving as a governor, when we developed you know the twelve points of identification, I was like, I mean, you know, I, maybe I would have <laughs> gone back I, exactly <laughs> right. because now all of a sudden I come out of state prison. I have a DOC. I don't have my birth certificate. I don't have my driver's social security. Driver's I don't have bills. No passport. Right? I, 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 and, and so people need to understand that's why like reentry organizations is so important because it allows people to reaccess, you know, healthy, civilized living so that they can be part of the fabric of social society. Okay, and when we come back, we'll talk about how these programs are gonna be funded going forward. We're back now, and all of the criminal reentry programs in the world are really no good unless there's money behind them, yes. and serious money here in New Jersey. Last year, Governor, uh, you almost didn't get your funds for it, correct? Yes, and, and I was very grateful to Speaker Coughlin and Senate President Sweeney, and. And, and, and the governor's office, and so we're going through this process. I mean, part of that is that we're spending two billion with a B in terms of imprisonment. And so I remember my friend Sen Senator Cunningham was trying to increase access to community college education, and, and people were pushing back. And, and this isn't, and, and I said, you know, if we were talking about building another prison, at a cost of $55,000 a year to keep some, everybody would say, okay. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that reentry works. The average cost per client is approximately $2,100. Um, our reincarceration rate is less than 10%, as opposed to a statewide average of over 30%. And so, what we're, you know, we're working with the administration, with the governor's office, we met with the Senate President's office and the speaker, and we're looking for, we have nine sites now, and if, you know, my office, bright young kids from Columbia and Cornell did the statistical analysis of how much money we're saving. But the point is, is not only are we saving a substantial amount of money, but we're enabling people to be productive citizens. So it's not only the, the reduced cost of incarceration, but the beneficial cost of the impact on families and rearing children and, and being part of healthy communities. And one would think in this administration, which has been putting families, communities, health care first, that this would just be an easy layup for you to get this money. It should be, and, and to the governor's point, it's about human potential and human capital. So not just saving taxpayer dollars, right, by having less folks in prison, but all their businesses, the good entrepreneurship, whether it's a cafe, right, or a hair braiding business, that's about strengthening communities, increasing public safety, right, and having families together. That's, that's innumerable. And, and understanding how difficult it is 
to take someone out of prison, to drop them in the middle of the state of New Jersey with no ostensible assets, identification, family, and ask them to flourish. Mm -hmm. It would be difficult for the three of us. Think how difficult it would be for somebody who's just spent 15 years at Northern State Prison or Trenton Prison. It is almost unimaginable. And so what we're doing is we're giving people a gateway, we're helping them navigate structures, systems, so that they can be productive citizens. I would argue this is the smartest, most efficient use of dollars, as opposed of you know putting them in prison for an extended period of time and just waiting for them miraculously to turn their lives around. It requires help. And finally, does the federal legislation that just went through, the criminal reform legislation, help you? Does that create some yes. inertia for yeah, you? Yeah, no, no, the, the federal, and I'm, I'm really grateful uh, to Senator Booker and to his chief of staff, George Helmy, who is now uh, the governor's chief of staff, because I think that was, to go to Erica's point, a sea change. It said in America, this isn't a partisan issue any longer. This is about opportunity and understanding that in incarceration for long periods of time isn't simply going to solve the problem. We need to provide a critical pathway to responsible citizenship. Earlier out, employment, training, addiction treatment programs, responsible citizenship. Are there funds that come along with that? On, on the federal side, but the, the federal side, the, the federal prisons are much smaller. The bulk of the challenge in New Jersey, candidly, are state prisons, which have so much larger populations. Right, okay. Well, this has been a great discussion. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for joining us for New Jersey Now. I'm Diane Doctor. We'll be back next week with another edition of New Jersey Now. Have a great day.